Well, good morning. It's a home game Saturday for me, so uh, you, you notice the M there, right? So I, um, I am a geologist, and I have lived two lives. Uh, one of my uh, interest areas, our uh, work areas, are mountains and earthquakes. And you probably know there's not a lot of mountains and earthquakes in Michigan, so I need something else to fill my day. And um, so the rest of the time that I spend time on is looking at things that are about the relationship between our changing world around and human society. And basically, that's what this uh, lecture is going to be about. So sort of geology, but in a, in a, in a sort of in a different way. And uh, of course, this audience will appreciate, students usually don't, but the audience appreciates the picture that uh, brings back memories probably for you, some of you. You watch the movies, that is. OK, so the Anthropocene, living in the Anthropocene. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, uh, the, the context of, 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 of this concept. But more than anything else, we're going to look at your life, uh, what the life might be like as it plays out. And um, uh, I try not to be this sort of this dystopian speaker that seems to be so often when we talk about our future, it always looks to be a sort of a Blade Runner type world. Um, actually give you a sense of, uh, of some solutions that are out there and, and actually some radical solutions, but bear with me. We'll see how they play forward. So, uh, but I thought what I'll first do is to give you a sense of, um, of, of how we got here, because we always sort of talk about our planet and stuff like that. But it's probably useful to start to think, first of all, that it, we didn't pick our planet. The planet picked us. And so that's a good way to start it as a concept to think a bit about um, as we got to this stage. So a one-minute clip. I hope it works. Always the challenge of uh, when you use videos. But uh, let's see if this one works. One minute. Thank you for coming. <laughs> so um, it's really important to realize, I said that before, is that, man, we picked just the right planet. It's just right for us. The Goldilocks planet, as we like to call that. And NASA likes to use that term because they like to sort of link with our memories. Uh, but man, it's just right for us. And it's important for us to realize that, that just right is actually not a huge tolerance for us. Because obviously, we didn't pick the planet. The planet picked us. We adjusted to our planet. And yes, it's right. The sun is not too far away. It's also not too close. The um, planet is not too big. It's not too small. So we don't weigh too much. Uh, that's right as well. Um, it's not too hot for a number of reasons, meaning the atmosphere does a nice job of keeping it uh, slightly warmer than it would be otherwise, otherwise be an icy planet. Uh, we actually have liquid water, which is really important because that's how life uh, is able to evolve. And even oxygen uh, that we actually uh, don't find it in, in other places is just right there because you and I kind of enjoy taking our oxygen on a steady basis. And so really, uh, it, it, this is why we picked that place. Of course, this is how we adjusted to this place. And the, really the question is when you change the environment of that place, uh, uh, um, what will that look like? In the video clip that, I, that you saw a minute ago, I only once turned on the, uh, the, the pointer for this little tiny critter. That's our ancestor. So um, 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs thought they were the top of the heap, and they were. Um, and there were a few critters living on the ground, and those are mammals, but not much of it. And then something happened to the dinosaurs, 
and suddenly mammals became this dominant species uh, that we are today. And I always remind people that the dinosaurs had a class like this, and they thought they were top of the heap, and nothing would happen to them. <laughs> Here we are, top of the heap. Some humility might actually be a good thing to think about, because changes have happened with time. Because there's a long history. The Earth has a history of, of a lot of changes, a lot of radical changes. And, and, and we're looking at today, um, but if you look back a little bit, which I'm not going to do in great detail, but a lot of things have happened. A lot of major changes, a lot of evolution, a lot of uh, interaction between the planets and, and species. And we had a lot of time. You know, we started uh, four and a half billion years ago. Mm, life became significantly more complicated around uh, 500 million years ago, give or take. But since that time, and this spiral is simply indicating, I'm not going to go into all the details there, but the spiral indicates all these major life forms that at some point in time were really the, the ones that were in charge of, of their environment. And here we are, sitting right there, this person sitting at that edge right over here. I always make the comment, like staring down at the abyss. But uh, this is how far we are today where humans are, and, and we are obviously a very powerful species. We, we control our world in, in, in many ways as we, as, as we go about that. And that's the underlying tone of this presentation. It's about the fact of the power of humans in shaping their world and also how the world might react and to some, in some ways the challenges that are before us. So it's a good term, the Anthropocene that I have, uh, that I use in this, so in this title. Um, there was some debate. Um, I, uh, uh, so so the, 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 what, does, what does a title like that mean? It doesn't even exist, the Anthropocene. And so uh, we've been arguing this case about the Anthropocene. And then the Atlantic would kind of um, got into the game because also to my surprise, um, some organization that is apparently in charge of what we say decided that they have a new word for where we live in. They have a new term, and it's called the, the Mega Lion. You should probably have to remember it because it's on the exam. But... Uh, Really, um, so we're talking about the Anthropocene, and suddenly these guys came out. And um, um, as you do on Twitter, your exchanges are always rather uh, enthusiastic. Regrettably, um, the, uh, the, the Atlantic felt it was the opening line of their debate was what my take was on that particular descriptor in there. <laughs> uh, it actually was WTF, okay? I mean, I, 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 uh, this, uh, so it's probably going to be scrubbed from the, from the posting here. But the point is... Um, it, it, it really is this, this, what I want to emphasize is we are really a major agent of, of change in our planet. There's no sense in getting some obscure little term up there. Um, you really should identify our role and our contribution. And so this, this is what geologists do. They spend their days figuring out where things fit in the scale. It's not interesting to you. It's barely interesting to me. Um, but the point is we should not forget the, the, the impact and, and the role of humans. And that's what we're going to look at. We're going to not look at the long history, which is the geology side of my life, but at this very short history and, and, and the time, uh, time forward. So it's actually a fun article. You should read it because there's, there's, I also made this somewhat oh, interesting commentary about being a big joke, this whole thing. And so, of course, they quote that. I lost some friends. I made a lot of new ones. So... <laughs> <laughs> Not by the University of Michigan, I'm sure. But so look at this crazy spaghetti diagram. It only has one purpose. This diagram wants to drive home to you the changes that have taken place in very recent time. Sitting where you, everybody can see this probably, 1750 to about 2000. And all these lines over here are just not scaled because they're all scaled to the same number. Times of, oh, sorry, they're, they are tracking changes that are taking place on our planet in this very recent time. And it, it, you can look at any of those lines, well, obviously the lines are rather compelling, that anywhere after 1900, everything zooms up. We look, we look at population in a second, we'll have a focus a bit on that. But the point is, you see that my point that humans are sort of uh, really uh, changing what's happening in this place is clear from this type of diagram. Uh, we like to call this the great acceleration because it really, it's not a linear increase. It seems to explode about 150 years ago as our impact is on the world around us. And that's something to keep in mind because we're right in the middle of the implications of that explosion of change. And we'll touch on a couple of things. We'll look at, uh, at population. Uh, and, and also we'll look a bit about a few other things about our, the food, water, energy nexus, the sort of what we need for our lives, and we'll look a bit at, uh, at land use. But this diagram, which is, is obviously, this is a physics lecture, so of course they'll hate this because there's nothing on the vertical bar. It's a typical geology graph. Only one line, <laughs> nothing on the vertical side. Uh, but it's because, they, of course, the numbers are all different. It's scaled in very different ways. But the nonlinearity is quite obvious. Um, it, it, it is an explosion. The question is, of course, where do these lines go uh, in, in the future? Uh, if you, it doesn't matter, by the way, if we go to 2010, but so that the plot is about it, the same. 
just give you one example. It's also a bit of a humbling example, I think. Uh, one example we'll start with, and then we'll look a bit more in more detail, about land use. You may or may not appreciate this, but just even where we live in North America, um, it was mostly forest, right? So when we talk about Brazil, we talk about Indonesia, we say, oh, be careful with your forest, don't take it away. You should say, don't do what we do. Because this is what the world looked like, I have to point one or the other, sorry. It's a forest <clears throat> in about uh, the 17th century, but as you get into this 1850 window, where we start to have the, uh, the Industrial Revolution, we still had about 60% coverage of forest, but it was already a little less, not a whole lot less, 23 million people. But look, if we only go uh, as, as 70 years later, we have already taken down a major, uh, the vast amount of, of lands, of forest land on, on our planet. And that's 106 million people at that, around that time, about 100 million people uh, living in, uh, in, in the area today. It's uh, 300 plus, of course. And the reason is, we just wanted that land. We just took it, right? We wanted land for crops. We wanted land for, for, uh, uh, for, for, for pastures, for, for grazing. We just took that land. And so it showed an incredible difference. Uh, Michigan was, was essentially a forest. Not today. Um, and that just gives you the first takeaway how much we impact our world. We often don't look back very far, but that's uh, sort of that, that example as we, uh, as we have our conversation with the rest of the world, especially as Americans, that we should look a little bit at how we did our practices. And it's kind of hard to argue that, well, leave those forests because we need them and we ourselves decided to, to get rid of nearly all of our forests that, that we have for purposes that are uh, uh, entirely for good use for food. But nonetheless, it's a significant change as, as we go forward. OK, well, let's have a look at this driver of, of why we did this kind of stuff, why we actually, what, what really made this happen. And we'll do it on a global scale. Don't worry, it's not, not a US bashing kind of talk. There's really no sense in that. Um, so all my slides will have text on it that is there. It just reminds me to say what I need to say. Don't worry uh, if, uh, if, if it doesn't look very clear. And if I didn't say it, I just skip over it. It just depends on what I want, sort of which my, my mind goes about these conversations. But I, I wanted to first get to the point is that, look, population is incredible. I mean, we really didn't have that many people on our planet. Uh, the, the human species was not that uh, much present. And again, uh, we had about a billion people at around 1800. So at, at sort of the first or the pre-industrial revolution, depending how you put the timing in there. But as you know, today we are um, um, close to seven and a half billion people. And as you can see, that line of this increase, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there we go, billions of people, that is sort of a, 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 a radical change. That's a lot of people that are there. And so the question is, what does the future like that would hold, right? What do, should we do if humans have such an impact? How many people will there be? And it's hard to predict exactly what population is, but actually not that difficult um, if you don't expect major dramatic changes. We can sort of take away the idea that we expect that we have around 9 billion people by the middle of this century. Uh, that's not that far away, the middle of this century, all right? It's 30, 30 or so uh, uh, years from now. Um, the interesting thing is, though we won't go into great detail, what we have seen, and many of you were uh, like me in school in the, uh, in the 60s or in the 50s or in the 70s, I was taught by now 12 billion people. That, 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 there was no food, we're going to be hungry, 12 billion people. This dystopian view is not new. When I was in high school, that was also, it's going to be, nah, it's going to be no, no 2020. Um, obviously, uh, we don't have that many people. Something happens, we have lower population growth, and we're seeing this population growth around the world slowing down. So we know that the world is not going to keep on getting just doubles and doubles of people. And maybe we'll end up with this number of around 11 billion as the level where bitch, whereby population stops. That may be sort of what we have to deal with. Why do we need to know this? It's because humans are using our planet for their world, for their lives, and therefore you need to know how many there are. You can sort of see how that, how that, how that plays forward. And these are just calculations you can do. It doesn't take a, a meteorite impact into account. The dinosaurs never planned that one either. Um, this is just simply looking at, at, at traditional trends in population. But it's a number to keep in mind, 10, 11 billion people that we have to, that we have to deal with. However, the challenge is actually not only just the number, it actually is where this happens. And this diagram over here, if you look at that, you see it oddly moving. It's sort of like, it's, it's not vertigo, it really is moving. Um, and what this diagram shows you is the proportion of population over time from different countries around the world. And the countries get bigger as their population grows disproportionately versus other countries. And you can see the number right up here. These are these predictions of these numbers, 2050, 2055. We keep on doing this. And as you can see, we don't change much. That's correct. Our population is not really growing. 
Um, but you see that Africa is certainly growing a lot. He's Nigeria. It starts all over again. He's Nigeria. Uh, obviously, uh, India uh, is growing and will keep growing. China, not. Uh, that sort of levels off. Uh, but it's already a large chunk, of course, because it already is a billion plus people. Um, but that's sort of the way you have to also not keep in mind that, wait a second, it's not just growing. We don't have suddenly 11 billion people living in North America. We actually, what we see is that these populations are very, the growth is very unevenly distributed. And this diagram is an XY diagram with that same pattern over here. It just wants to drive on one point, is that if you look at population growth, look at that, it's about uh, right over here, about 9 billion people. All that population growth before us is going to happen not in the Western world, but it's going to happen in, uh, developing, in, in developing nations, or we used to call that third world, but developing nations, e emerging economies. And that's the entire growth that's going to take place. So the demands and the challenges will be large for those areas. It's, it's, it's really an important understanding. The Western world will not grow. It will sort of stabilize at about a billion people, the Western world being the rich uh, will st stabilize around at that particular level. And that's a big challenge because suddenly you have to realize how can the people in these other nations actually have access to the stuff that we're familiar with and how will they actually find that access as they go forward. Now, 10, 11 billion people is what we have to deal with. So one way we try to um, uh, describe this framework of demands that humans have is this, uh, it's actually a good concept, this, uh, this idea that this connectivity of, of food and water and energy, those are sort of a good descriptor of our immediate demands that we have on, on our planet, right? We need to eat, we need water, we need to drink, but I mean water, okay? I mean, it's just, it's, 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 little, it's a little early. Well, it's five, it's five o'clock somewhere. Um, but uh, uh, we, we need to sort of, we need water. Um, and what powers every modern economy is energy. What is the definition of modern economy, and modern life, I should say, is just energy. And not just, I'm not talking about driving your car, I'm <laughs> talking about driving, making your clothes. Uh, anything we do has, uh, requires energy in, 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 in a modern society. And so, just as a fun thing, I put these numbers down. As I said, I, I put them up to give you a flavor. You read them, some things might interest you, other things might interest you. The whole driver here is that we are big consumers. We have a large demand on our planet. It's also very uneven, right? I mean, uh, the US and, and Canada and, and, and Western Europe are larger consumers than these nations that will grow. But these nations won't just grow in population. They will grow in demand as well. But it's, it's very uneven. Um, water, well, um, that's going to be a, a, an issue. Why? Well, we use a lot of water. Uh, you might think that water only counts what you drink, right? You get your water bottle, you drink a water bottle. How much do you drink? Well, you do the number over here. About 1,000 liters, so that's about a cubic meter this big by this big by this high of, bo of water bottles. Hopefully not all water bottles. But that's not true. You use 1,000 times more of that of water. You just don't know it in that particular way. You don't grow crops without water. You don't uh, even generate energy without water. And so the real use of water is a staggering number. You use nearly a million liters of water on a, on, on a, on a, on a yearly basis per person. That's an enormous amount of water. That water is there, but as you'll see in a second, it's not everywhere easily accessible. And of course, the energy part is, as I said, the other driver is that, well, we are rather heavy users of energy. Um, Europe is a little bit less, but certainly also does its thing. China is about equal with Europe nowadays. But these large growing nations that we talked about are still using much less in energy. The numbers don't matter. It's just a relative number that matters. Well, they matter, but not for this purpose. But you see that those countries which will grow, uh, even if they would never use more energy, it still you have to multiply it by 3 billion to actually see their consumption. But they won't. They'll grow. These numbers will get that size, and hopefully not that size. And you start to see the scale of, uh, of the demand that we have on our planet. And the planet is the deliverer of all this stuff, right? I mean, it's not that we make it. We simply take it. And hopefully, we wisely uh, uh, use it in, in some ways. But it's always a sobering thing to get a sense of, of, of these numbers. And, and I do it by person in particular, so you, so you actually can relate to it a little bit. These numbers are not small. And as I said, we are winning on that one. We are good users of the food, water, energy nexus. But so are the other nations as, as they go by. And so the question is, the question that you then ask is that, what is, well, you use the word sometimes, sustainable, but I'll explain it in a second. I don't like that word very much in this context. But what can the planet take, right? Uh, seven billion, well, apparently, yes. And also, I'll show a little bit that we have all the supplies for seven billion people. Nine billion looks to be a number that is probably without much uh, to do. We can handle that. 
11, yeah, that might be a bit of a challenge. 13, oh, that might be really a big challenge. Now, I don't think we're going to go there. We'll probably will stick at this number over here. But the bottom line is we are using the goods and the service that the planet gives us. We just simply expect all that access. And so we can do calculations and say, how much is there? How many people are there? Is there enough? Um, well, that's the first calculation you could do. And then you can say, well, where is it? Right? I mean, maybe it's there, but where is, where there, where is there? It may not be in India, and yet in India you want it. And we live in America. Much of what we have is not here. We get it from somewhere else, too. And so this is why this, these numbers that I just showed you and the realization of consumption are really something to, to, to think about. And, and, and don't make it just a general number, but look at it on a per-person basis, and, and it drives home a little bit better as, as we go about this particular ways. So let's look at a few of these things. I'll, I'll go through them rather quickly. I just want to leave the examples. Food, right? There's hunger on this planet. There is no need for hunger on this planet. Right? There is enough food. We had this spectacular, clever technology development in the 60s called the Green Revolution that actually showed that, wait, we can feed 9 billion people if we want to. 7 billion today and 9 billion in the future. But unfortunately, 900 million, but the numbers say, 900 million people are hungry on our planet. It's, it was inexcusable. And the reason is largely, it was nearly entirely politics. Um, and, and food is used as a weapon. There is volume-wise enough food on our planet. And so it, it's always something to keep in mind that, that we are humans. We don't always show our best side when it comes to these things. But there is enough food, uh, even for, for 9 billion people on, on our planet. Water. Well, water, there's also enough water, but water has the problem, it's harder to transport around. You, water, it's a large volume, even if you drink a thousand liters that you need on a yearly basis, that's a lot of buckets of water to carry from one point to the other. Water doesn't travel very well, um, and it's disproportionately um, uh, distributed around the world. We are the richest state in the world, Michigan. We have most access to fresh water. Uh, there's, there's more fresh water in some other places, perhaps, but. But for Michigan, this is it. We are the, the, the oil of Michigan is the fresh water. And um, um, it, it is stupendous. A quarter of the fresh water is accessible uh, just around us in, in the Great Lakes. That doesn't help India very much. It's a long way to carry a water bottle from the Great Lakes uh, to India. But the number on, on the whole is there. So, so we could say, well, there may be uh, enough water. But it's not movable. It's a really difficult thing to move water around because it's a large volume. Um, um, basically, it, it, it really is, it, it's, that's a bigger challenge already. Uh, most of the fresh water is tied up in ice sheets. Uh, we're doing the best we can to melt the ice sheets. That's a good job. I mean, that's a, well, we don't capture the water. So we might think about that. Maybe there's a solution there to play with. Um, by the way, I'm not kidding. People are actually dragging ice sheets and, and using that as a supply for fresh water. Uh, if you have enough money, like Saudi Arabia, you can drag these things around. And, and they do. Um, that's actually quite an interesting way to look at the world. Energy. Third one, again a diagram, sorry if you hate XY diagrams, um, but, but I just wanted to show you, we actually have numbers. This is not just only a warm and fuzzy conversation. Uh, we actually put numbers to bear. All right, um, energy consumption. Good news, the US is not really using much more energy. It's good news because we're using a lot of energy. So, so we don't grow anymore, we stabilized, and we're very proud of that, and we should be proud of that, because it actually it shows that there is a limit to the use but those other nations around the world also want to live like us. Their environment, uh, sorry, their, their life also wants the same quality we have. That means they have a stronger economies that have a more modern world, and a modern world takes energy. It's just the equation. Modern world, energy goes hand in hand. More modern, more energy, because everything is based on, uh, on, on the needs for, uh, for, to power the, uh, the, the system that we have. And what you get is that those countries will need energy. Now you could say, well, maybe they should level off too. But remember the forest. Let's be a little bit honest here. Why should they level off? Well, we got all we want, and then they should not get as much. They have a very large need for energy. And it's a very sobering point to make, because that, that, that growth will be, these are projections by, the, uh, by these organizations that try. Every year, they change their numbers a little bit. I think this plot is from, I can't see it as quickly where I put it. Maybe it's last year. I try to update them every year, but it's about the same numbers. But all this red area right over here are the non-wealthy countries. They're going to grow. The wealthy countries still will keep about the same level. The OECD is the wealthy countries. Um, but these other countries will need more energy because they want to give water to the people. They want to give schooling. They want to have hospitals. They uh, even want to have some money left over at the end of the day. Um, and so that's where that growth will go. Um, and in spite of what you often hear about, there is absolutely no evidence that that will be significantly supplied by energy alternatives that we call renewables. 
70, if not 80%, by the year 2050, in the middle of the century, will still be mostly fossil fuels. I'll touch on that in a second because that is something to, to, to remember. You may ask me later on why that is, but yes, we want to get renewables, and it's great to do that. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I, I try what I can, but obviously I'm a huge consumer, and so what should I talk about myself? All of us are huge consumers. The other nations, they need rapid access to a lot of energy, and man, oil is a powerful way to get energy. And so all that growth will still be largely by, uh, by fossil fuels. We'll look at emissions in a second. We'll look at the implication of this um, in, in a second. So... Food, water, energy nexus. That, that, that's just, this is the reality. You can look at numbers, you put a multiplier in there, you can start to get a sense of what the earth has to, has to deliver. Um, I hope you're still with me on this. I want to do one segue before I go to the next thing, and that gives you the, the, the reason of the title. So the big buzzwords, about 20 years ago, I started to, to, to lecture on this with, with students. I, I had a class on this campus uh, with two other colleagues. I think we were the first to use the word sustainability on this campus. Now everything is sustainability, right? I mean, it's sustainable English language, sustain whatever it is. Uh, but we had a class on sustainability. And that aim of sustainability thinking was like, what is a good path forward, right? So, so what is a, is a definition? You could ar argue what the definition is the one that we used, that we started about just, uh, 20 years ago. I used to do the Global Change Program on, on this campus, educational program. Um, so it's, it's just about, let's leave a future for our kids, right? And that's hasn't changed very much. But it's telling us basically what you should do, what may be a better way forward. Um, the nice way to say it is aspirational. The reality is nothing changed. 20 years after all we talked about is what we should do, how we could do, we had nothing really significantly changed. And so what I've come to, to realize, I can talk about sustainability until I drop and everybody nuts, everybody's <laughs> a better world, let's clean the world, good, yes. We don't do anything. We really have not changed our habits. And we is not just us, the whole world has, has not changed. So I came to realize that what people don't enough appreciate is that there's an implication there, there's an impact to that decision. And that's what this concept of resilience is trying to emphasize. And just, uh, I'm sure many of you like me read the New York Times, or I actually like the Guardian a lot, but the New York Times, the word resilience is starting to come up in the New York Times more and more because they realized that affects you. It's about can you handle life on this planet? What should you expect? As opposed to me telling you should drive a Prius, and by the way, you could argue that's a great step by itself, but, or should I just simply uh, tell you that if you don't have a lower energy consumption, expect this to happen to you as, as time goes by. So this concept of resilience is actually much more powerful because it tells you what you should expect, but also, and I really like that part, it's actionable. And I'll give you, at the end of the talk, a radical actionable model to, to think about. And you will be horrified. Some of you will be, but others may not. But it's, at least we can do something. If you know there's an impact, you usually try to avoid that, right? If, if, if the wind blows, you close the window and stuff like that. So that's what resilience is. So this is not the same word. And, um, and, and I know on, on our campus now, we, sustainability is, is the word that we see in a lot of places. Remember resilience. Uh, five years from now, it's, there will be resilience institutes everywhere. Um, uh, so, so I tried, just as, 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 as Seas was coming online, as I said, we did sustainability. And I, I reminded them, how about a resilience institute? And then Provost Martha Pollack said, oh, come on, Ben, I just got sustainability down. Now next. <laughs> so, uh, but seriously, uh, it is about us being able to bounce back, to, uh, to, to actually um, 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 uh, experience and know what to do with it. And that gets people's attention. If you know what you should expect, you pay attention. And that's what resilience does. And so that's why I call this resilient society. But also, it forces you to do the next thing. It forces you to think about what you want to do. We are not sort of sheep that are led to this sort of pasture. We can chart our own future. Remember, we made food in the 60s that never was never supposed to be there. The Green Revolution is just clever work to generate more food on our planet because we are really a pretty smart uh, species. And we'll look at that in a little bit. So I thought, what should I pick out as, as a topic to sort of emphasize? And it's not very hard what to pick. So let's look at, uh, yes, brace yourself. Let's look at, at, at climate. <laughs> it's, it's, it comes up every now and then. It's, it's not, not a huge topic. I don't hear much about it. Um, it is not polarizing. Um, it, it's, just, uh, it, 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 it's, just, uh, it's just, it's one of these fun topics we can talk about. And it has some implication. Um, all right, you, you know all about this. I don't have to uh, repeat it. I'll do it anyhow to some extent, but I don't have to repeat it in great detail. But the point is, of course, that scientists have been, well, first mumbling, then they sort of quietly, kind of get louder, 
uh, they start to say, we are changing the climate of our planet. Um, why are they not, did it take so long for us to be outspoken about that? It's because you're not supposed to be, as a scientist, to be so firm. There's always tolerances, there's always uncertainty, and so we don't say, this is it. No, it might be like that. Um, scientists make poor politicians, and politicians make poor scientists. Um, uh, but we actually, frankly, scientists dropped the ball enormously. By the 90s, we already knew that this was a likely forward play. Not because that we saw how it was working out. The fact that we have the climate that we have is because we have an atmosphere that does certain things. We know how the atmosphere works. Our planet would be frozen without greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases is, of course, the culprit here. Let's look at it in a second. But our planet would be mostly frozen without greenhouse gases. Man, thank you for CO2. It's the best thing that happened to us. Like many best things, too much may not be good for us, but nonetheless, we already knew, we always knew how this works. Our planet is a Goldilocks planet because we have an atmosphere, the atmosphere keeps it a little warmer, and voila, we have liquid water, and here you are, the product of liquid water, um, reactions in liquid water. Uh, but it's getting warmer, all these diagrams, it's only a couple more months before we have our next press release, we point out it's the <laughs> hottest year on record, probably the third or the fourth, although October really throws a wrench in this. It's a little nippy for October. Um, luckily, July was a scorcher, so whew, we're still not in great trouble. We can still say it's pretty hot. On a day, we should look at decadal things. Climate is not the weather. That's a big mistake that we also make often. Climate is a decadal or, or centuries effect. And undoubtedly, the next decade, the, the, sorry, the current decade, is going to be the hottest decade on record, however you want to play it. And whether the years are, uh, the decade will be very hot. So, all right. I told you a bit about that context. Um, how did scientists actually, they knew how it worked, but how did we actually have a, a player? How can we actually see uh, that, that, that changes were taking place? We had a few recorders. My favorite has always been ICE, because ICE is a very sensitive recorder of the conditions of our planet. Because, as I just told you, without CO2, there would be a frozen planet, ICE, frozen, and with a lot of CO2, more water, and with even a lot more CO2, there's no water either, you know, just have vapor and you get into the world of Venus, which is not a great place. We can measure these things. It just took us a, a couple of decades to really get these numbers down. We knew how the system worked, but we couldn't show the data, but today the data is all around us. We can look at global average temperatures. Uh, yeah, you can even do it at, at regional average temperatures. Uh, you can look at snow cover. I always look at ice as a good indicator because ice is so close to melting and have less ice cover. So, so we know that, and we know the answer to this is simply the atmosphere. The atmosphere has uh, gases in it that have a property of warming the surface. And by the way, it only warms the surface. It doesn't warm the rest of the atmosphere. This is not violating physics. God forbid I violate physics in the Saturday morning's <laughs> physics. I mean, it's just, uh, um, uh, uh, luckily, not, hopefully not too many physicists are after me. Um, but that, it just warms the surface. Why does it matter? That's where we live, right? I mean, why do you care what the core of the Earth does? Why do you care what the upper atmosphere does? You live on the surface. So everything we talk about is the surface. And that is warming up. Uh, thank you for those, those, those CO2 gases that, that are in there. We don't know exactly. It took us a while to figure out the scale of that change. But the scale is, is, is not trivial. The scale actually is, is now we see it encompasses everything. Uh, we can go to a lot of different areas and a lot of different topics to show the impact. We're starting to see those impacts. Um, and remember, it's about resiliency, right? I'm not telling you what to do. I'm starting to tell you what you should expect. And we find out it impacts on everything. Um, it's not just that it gets a little warmer. That is, has an impact. And you could argue, well, oh, not too bad for Michigan. By the way, it's great for Canada. And I'm not kidding. Uh, not just because Canada is cold, but I mean, there will be different weather patterns there. There will be better growth season there. Um, so some countries will be winners in this. Um, and, and actually, the, you're never supposed to say there's any winners in climate change. But even the, uh, the northern states in the US will certainly not be losers in this game because we have a different types of growth seasons. We have lots more water. Water is the big currency we have. And so, but the point is there are other things though, health issues. Agricultural practices will change. Uh, I already talked about forest, which you don't have much left, but in the rest of the world as we go forward. Um, weather patterns will change. Um, um, temperature, therefore, of course, will, will have an impact. Um, and sea level rise will change. By the way, that's always a good topic for me. I'm Dutch. The Netherlands is built on the, on the sea level. You wonder who did that? <laughs> What kind of plan is that? To build a country that's half underwater? Well, you know, why not? It's all you have left. Uh, it's sort of 
the Germans didn't give us much room to say, you can have that part. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and so, and my favorite joke is always people ask, why are the Dutch so tall? I said, sea level rise. I mean, <laughs> uh, we're the last ones breathing, right? <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. Um, so anyhow, so, so there are all, all these different impacts. And, and what you can do, like everything I told you about, you can and, and play uh, forward scenarios with, with, with numbers. Um, and I have to have one equation. I, I, I was asked to give this lecture, and I said, make sure you have an equation or an experiment. So I had an equation, but I give you a social science equation. It's sort of softer. It's a little <laughs> bit. Uh, it, but it is an equation, and it's an equation that actually you will remember. It's, actually, it's very known. It's, it's a well-known equation. It's called the iPad equation which helps you to understand why we're so certain that we need to think about resilience, because we can quantify in a social science way, meaning framing it in some ways, what impact is. Impact really just tracks um, the population. You have more people, bigger population, you'll have a bigger impact, whatever the, the driver of that impact is. Um, if you have a society that is frail, which ours is, because we have buildings that don't do well and there's winds and we, we have cars that don't start in the morning, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the, the, the fact that you have the wealth that you have, affluenza is the, the A for that, is a good term to, of wealth. It's a soft way of saying being rich. Uh, but affluenza, the more affluent the society is, the more I impacted it is, right? You see that today, we have a storm. It looks like every storm costs a billion dollars. And actually, that's not true. Every storm costs $10 billion um, because they damage things that we have and we really are not, we're not ready for that because we didn't think about the resilience part. We just thought about, eh, it's just a storm. But our society is more and more sensitive to these storms, especially the developed uh, societies. And the third lever in that, the third part out over here, this T over there is technology. And technology is blamed for everything because, because we have technology. We drive, we drive cars. It gives us pollution and, and stuff like that. Also, by the way, is healthcare. So it's not all that bad. Um, but technology is usually seen as, as the negative driver in that because if you do a, a little thinking about that, this is a multiplier. So you have more population, more influenza, more technology. The impacts will be very high. And impacts usually are not positive. You like things to stay the way they are. You, you could argue that's not the case. But for most people, that is sort of how we, we, we look at, at, at the world around us. And so when you try to solve these equations, you actually think a bit about sort of what, what's the quality that we have before us. We should make decisions about the quality of our lives. And ours is not North America, but it's, it's, it's the, the, the entire world. A, a popular term in a very small group is this word, word thriveability, which I can barely pronounce, uh, which tries to emphasize that it's, it's good to live. Um, actually, it is good to live. Um, and so, but it's, it's, you have to really understand all these elements that we just talked about, the food, water, energy nexus, the other impacts, which I don't talk about in this talk, uh, but generally the well-being. The impact is, is, is what, what's starting to be bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And what we want to understand is what are the impacts and what we, can we do about these impacts. And there is a, um, as I said, this is growing. Um, all the nations want to get wealthier. This is about the only lever you have in this game, unless you address the other ones, which, which you might think about, but it may not be so optimistic. So this one right over here, this, this is the only lever that can go up and can go down. If you want to reduce the impact or grow the impact, you actually have the lever of technology to, to think about the solutions that are before you. And remember, technology gave us the foods that we are relying on today. So uh, it, it has certainly good sides to it. So let me give you a bit of a thought pattern Think along with me about sort of this, this big debate that's going on about climate change is bad, which, which, which it certainly is if you, because it changes the environment. And, and what are we going to do about it? All right? And it, man, it's in every newspaper continuously. And notice, by the way, the big open area here. There will be something here, just to, for a second. All right, so, so I, 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 uh, I get these reports, and I, I do my duties. I, I read some of the draft reports. But the big thing was, whew, we agreed that we want to limit climate warming. Done. Let's move on to the next topic. Um, that is the Paris Accord right over here. Um, the paper is full of it. All the politicians talk about it all the time. They all agree. And uh, first we agreed on 2 degrees Celsius as a maximum increase because uh, it's a nice round number. Really, that's fine. It goes. It's a Fahrenheit, an unusual number in Fahrenheit, but the rest of the world doesn't do Fahrenheit. And so it's two Celsius. Well, no, said some of the nations that uh, saw sea level rise as the biggest threat. That's not good for us. We'll be underwater. So one and a half degree. 
All right, that's now the thing we're trying to see. How can we reach one and a half degree? Papers are full of it. Can we limit climate change to one and a half or two degrees? It doesn't matter. Well, it matters, but, uh, but here's the problem. This is utter nonsense. We haven't changed our ways at all. I mean, sure, it's great to say, yeah, let's all agree to agree that we're not going to do this anymore. Meanwhile, emissions around the world kept growing. Yes, the U.S. has no more emissions than it had the last two years. That's great. But India is not going to sit there and say, I'm so proud that the U.S. is not growing in emissions. Uh, we're just also not going to do it anymore. No, they're growing. China is now the largest producer of CO2. And so what we're seeing is around the world that emissions are growing. What we're also seeing is that many of these politicians are, hold on, lying. <laughs> They say it, but they don't do it. And then they bail, right? I mean, they say, oh, we really want to do this. It's not going to work for us. Um, now, U.S., usually the leader, is the leader in this as well. We, we were the first to say we're not going to do this. But other nations are all, 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 all violating this. Australia says it now out loud. All the Western nations are failing what they promised. The rich nations are failing. Germany will has start to go back to a carbon culture because they got away with, with, with nuclear energy. The bottom line is, it's great to say we're going to all agree to do this, but nobody has. There is really no evidence that that is actually a, a trajectory whereby we reduce emissions. We've got to be a little bit more honest. Emissions will keep growing. Um, so that puts us on a difficult track. Because if you just step over the night's conversation and say, let's do a better world, blah, 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 it's going to go grow. It's going to get warmer. Now, if you spend some time, which most of us don't, but people like me have to in some ways, if you actually look at what these people who are writing these agreements, they're not idiots. They simply say something that makes us feel a little better, but they also realize that even, even if we would level emissions to where they are today, which we are not, by the way, it's growing, but even if you did, it's not going to be enough. The, a bunch of papers came out in 2017. Busy diagram, I know, and I'll just explain these things. You don't even have to look at the slides. I hope the narrative will fill it in. But we realized, wait, this is all great, but even if we slow down emissions radically, which we are not in the next 10 years, then we still have way too much CO2 in the atmosphere, and that will have 200 more years of an effect on our planet. It is not a, a button that you turn up, up or down. If, it's like the thermostat in your house. If you go turn up the thermostat, it will take a little while to warm up the room. If you turn it down, in, in class I would do this. Say, you turn up the thermostat, and the students look at me like, what the hell is he doing? <laughs> you turn up the thermostat like this, right? Um, so, so, the, uh, <laughs> so the point is, and if you turn down the thermostat, or in the class that I teach, that way, then of course it takes a couple hundred years for the temperature to go down. We know this is not working even if we stop. So you need to be resilient because the change will happen regardless of what, what, what the narrative is. And so we call that, this is this concept that also, write it down, look it up in the New York Times, it's coming up, negative emissions. We got to get rid of this CO2. It is not going to happen that we have lower emissions, but even if we do the right thing in the sense of lowering it, and, and, and that actually is a huge challenge because we're not the only ones that are involved. There's poorer nations that are there. We still need to get rid of stuff. And that is that big realization that we, oops, wrong button, that we need to actually address this situation that can we not, hold on, use technology to actually reverse the process that we're after because everything that we plan requires some sort of intervention with what the atmosphere looks like. And that's a scary term. It's called climate intervention. Oh my God, we're going to tinker the climate. And I said, yeah, we've done so far. Last 150 years we tried that experiment. So let's not get sort of too bent out of shape. You might be able to do that a little bit better also in, in, in another way. Um, it's scary because now we're basically saying, wow, we're going to really tinker with the atmosphere. So we can, maybe we can block out the sun. Um, that sounds silly, but actually that's the primary driver of, uh, of, of the heat at the surface of the Earth, obviously the sun, and so maybe you can turn down the sun a little bit. Um, and, 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 well, you think this is crazy. Actually, it probably is. But you can put something in the atmosphere to sort of shield our atmosphere from all the sunlight coming in. We're only interested in the surface part, so we only need to deal with that part. We don't care about the, the, the troposphere and the... And the, 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 the um, uh, the higher levels, uh, the troposphere where we live in, 
but uh, the higher levels of the atmosphere. So maybe we can just actually just turn down the sun a little bit. Uh, so that's sometimes, I, I always call it treating the symptoms of this process. If you are uh, in healthcare or you're sick, you get treated for the symptoms, but most of us would like to get rid of the disease, right? That's really the better way to go. And so the only solution there is to actually get rid of carbon dioxide. Now, that for the last 20 years has been the most idiotic conversation piece that scientists brought up because all my colleagues, in including myself, for that said, oh, please, let's not start to engineer that crazy and let's go that far. Well, okay, but then you have to accept a very different world. If you don't do this, the world will look very different and will be a big stressor for a lot of people. And so slowly we're starting to see this realization that, well, maybe we should address the, the, the illness. Maybe we should consider, only consider so far, that we actually play around with that. And the buzzword, because it sounds softer, is called negative emissions. It sounds softer. It's just, okay, okay, I'm okay with negative emissions, but no geoengineering. All right? All right? No, that's crazy talk. <laughs> Negative emissions. Well, if it works, it works. And um, just Wednesday, I tuned this talk exactly for the schedule, the National Academy of Sciences, which first came out with this, oh, geoengineering, the craziest thing I've ever heard only two years ago, three years ago. Uh, Marsha McNutt was running that at the time. Um, came out with a report that says, frankly, we're ready to go. We're ready to actually start to address this, this fact that we remove the CO2 out of the atmosphere. This is not just a theoretical thing. We have patterns before us, and it's an engineering study, so technology is their thing, of course, man. And they show, yeah, we, we can start to scale this out. It just came out on Wednesday, and just the papers are writing up a bit about it now, and they're still it's a scary bit writing it. But there's a lot of playbook out there. It is not enough. Remember this one, to talk about emissions reduction. It's even worse to talk about and not doing it. But the emissions reduction that will be needed to stabilize our climate are so large, so quick, it just won't happen. And so this negative emission is starting to come up like, well, either you accept the change, or you start to look at, 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 these, uh, at these various options that we, we have in this, uh, in, this, in this game. Okay, this next slide is incredibly busy. And all these things on the site had one purpose, We've been thinking about this for decades. This is not something like, oh, wow, that's an idea. Let's see what we can do. We understand the natural system really well. We know what could be done to actually change the CO2 budget of our planet. By the way, it's mostly CO2. I don't talk about methane uh, because, well, for different reasons, but CO2 is still the primary uh, impact because we generate mostly CO2, uh, not much methane at this stage. But look at the list of these things on the side. Many of these things are all words you maybe you've never heard of or descriptors you've never heard of. As I always say, they're on the exam, so make sure you remember. No. But, but here's the obvious one. Just take it out. If you can put it in, can you take it out, right? Well, that's not trivial, but it's actually doable. Um, any, uh, any, uh, and if you do um, send astro astronauts out there and they, they, they look at the planets, uh, they go and uh, go to the moon and stuff like that, their atmosphere has to be cleaned up. They scrub their atmosphere of CO2. So uh, watch the movie, Mars. Uh, that's a good example. You scrub the CO2. Can be done. It's really expensive. Yeah, as if climate change is not. <laughs> I mean, it's like, uh, oh, billions of dollars. Yeah, that's called a storm here. Um, <laughs> so, um, it, and it's very inefficient because there's a lot of molecules. And you just want to get a few out of there. It's not a very efficient way. But it's the most obvious one because at least you don't expect other scenarios to take place. We can do it. They're, it's just very expensive. And we don't like expensive things because they're expensive, but it can be done. There are other ones, and I'm not going to go through all of these. I just wanted to, to plant the seed in your mind that as you look now and read the papers, keep your eye on this negative emission because they, will, they have more and more descriptors. There's clever ways. The trees can do things. We can reforest. Oh, my gosh, yes, put the trees back. Uh, they, are, they are sequestering uh, CO2 really well. But it's a bit of a crazy idea, and I'll probably be fired after this, but I don't have this story, but, but you're willing to listen to this as, as, we, as we go forward. But it will be more of a bigger player because the other ones are not moving forward. It's good to talk sustainability, and if but nobody does anything, then maybe you should think about resilience, meaning you like what the change, or you, you take the change, or we affect, we be actionable on, on the change. And so, the last few things is that I really want you to want to move away from this downing talking. Everything is a downer. It's this dystopian world. It's, it's just, oh, there's no future. We're not idiots, all right? We, we have lived through challenges before, and, and if we just get our minds to it, 
we'll find ways. We, we, we may have to make some choices, but we're not passive players in this. And so it's always been treated like, oh, we don't any better. I just got to keep my car running because it's cold. Um, no, we, we can make these changes. I mean, we really are, are, are we're really smart, but we have a limited number of, of, of sets. And technology is, whether we like it or not, one of the most logical sets that we do. So use your heads, right? That, that's, that's the first one. Just think about this and, and play with that. Inevitable in this is also, you know, we do not need a lot more people on this planet because it just multiplies the issue. And so programs, family planning type of programs in, in parts of the world where population growth is large, going to be critical to stabilize these population dynamics. We have stabilized ours. Now, you don't want to overstabilize it. You become like Italy where you have fewer children than adults and you have all these inversions that are difficult for society. But certainly the growth uh, of, of population should be considered as, as, as a discussion item in many nations. And countries have done that. Thailand radically had to change their policy. China, in a, not a nice way perhaps, but changed their policy and population growth. It's just a reality. We have to have fewer forks on the table. It's a pre-lunch talk, so I thought I'd put some food in there. You know, you can sort of warm up. It's sort of a, um, and the other thing is, just like when you go for dinner, have better manners, right? Wait before you start to dig in. Um, it, essentially, we, we, we need to understand that this is something together. And poli politicians are just failing us there. We are failing maybe them as well. But the point is, government does not want to talk about these things anymore on a, on a big scale. Yeah, they'll like a meeting, two degree limit to the, to the uh, Paris Accord. Good, sounds good. But they don't really give leadership to get us there. They don't really make plans to actually make these things happen. Uh, subsidies or, or basically outlawing some type of behaviors. We should expect more from the people that govern us. Uh, that's really what we should do. Or we should elect better people. Or we should step up ourselves, right? I mean, it, it is really that, that playbook. So we're smart, maybe to many of us. But we also should look at our manners. We are the wealthy nations. We probably don't necessarily deserve more of our planet. We simply take more of our planet because we can. So why is that not moving forward? Last few slides. <laughs> Got the movie? Which movie is it? There you go, right? Man, this is great. I, I, I teach in intro class. I moved to intro this year. And I just show these clips and I and because Jaws, yeah, isn't that Jaws 4? <laughs> uh, no, but there's a big issue here. Why is not much happening? Why is it just talk? And the reason why it's just talk most of the time is that we have a, a hugely difficult way for us to deal with slow change. We, we don't react to slow change. Man, there's a disaster. Everybody runs out and helps and does what it can. But slow change, it, we're not wired for that. We just don't really say, oh, well, tomorrow, a little bit, uh, it's okay, maybe a week from now or a year from now. That is an, an, a big issue. We don't really are wired to react to slow change. And many of the things I talked about are slow change. The Earth does not tick on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. It goes on a year, a decadal basis, and hundreds of years. And so we're not wired very well for that. It doesn't help that scientists are, are really all agree that, man, this climate warming is not a great thing, or the uh, consumption of resources is not a great thing. But we hardly agree what it means. Um, and so th there's a big sort of uh, divided divisions in the solutions that, that, are, that are before us. The one I gave you about removing CO2, ask any of my science colleagues and they'll say, yeah, idiot. <laughs> and maybe they're right. But we should consider the options and not just simply say, ah, I don't like that. And, and I bet you this will, things will come up more as, as, as time goes by. Um, then, of course, we like what we have. Right? The developed nations, are, are, they would like to give away some things. We don't really want to radically change our lives. We are comfortable with where we are. These other nations want to be like us, but we don't want to be like them. Right? And so that's the other impediment. Because it's, it's costly. It changes the things. It will make a radical expectation that society, our society, should look different. And, and that's not that comfortable. You know? it's, it's not something that we, we are, 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 again, wired for to do. But if you know what the implication, if you're not doing this, will be, then maybe you are willing to go in that, in that, in that particular route. So there are solutions. Um, it's just that the solutions require us to actually be actionable, to actually decide to, 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 to make some steps and not just talk about steps and say, yeah, that's a great, we should do this, we should do that. We really have to sort of uh, accept that there's maybe we should, have our innovation should focus on these things. Maybe we should have more use inspired science taking place, thinking about solutions and how they can play forward. 
Maybe it's crazy to pull CO2 from the atmosphere. But it's also crazy to have nuclear energy, and yet we have it, right? So we are really clever. We've used our minds for a lot of different, different ways. Um, you know, there will be an economic price to pay. But what is economics? Is that wealth? Having more money makes you happier and, and better off? Uh, not that I know of. Now, in Ann Arbor, we're very privileged. Um, we all do pretty well. Nearly all of us do, do pretty well. But we don't have to be like Bill Gates, all of us. Uh, we also don't want to be like, like the poor people. But the point is, it, it's just understanding about what, what, what economics in our thinking is, what, what our mindset is as, as we go forward. And really, the way that I often always tell people is that this is not somebody else's problem. This is not somebody else's solution. This is ours. I mean, it is, if you make your own choices, you make your decisions to address these issues, it sort of propagates forward. Now, one person is only one out of seven and a half billion, but is it two, is it three? Small changes matter. It's a big mistake we made as scientists that we said it has to be global agreement. Well, nothing worked globally. But maybe our leaders in Ann Arbor could make rules that actually just shut down downtown Ann Arbor for car driving. I know. But the point is, it is not something that is somebody else's. It is us, right? So you can make individual choices, and that propagates forward. That makes you aware of, of the things before you, but also you're willing to start to change the, the system that you have. And, and of course, tuning to another memory that you have, you know, uh, this is not new. Uh, we've all got in high, uh, Dr. Seuss already told us what to do, right? Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. Thank you.